My name is Dr. Ilana Gurvich, and I will be presenting today about candida overgrowth in a GI map and how to treat it effectively in clinical practice. Today we're going to be discussing Melanie, who was a 68-year-old female with a very complicated medical history when she presented to my office. She had two years prior to her first visit with me been diagnosed with rectal cancer. She was treated for the cancer with both chemotherapy and radiation, and luckily she didn't need any surgical interventions. Her last colonoscopy was six months prior to the first visit with me, and it was completely clear. She had no cancer found, no polyps. They also did a lot of vitamins biopsies and she was completely clear there, no microscopic colitis or any other pathologies. On top of that, Melanie had a three uh, had three strokes prior to her first visit with us. That also made communication a little bit more troubling. She had a hard time finding words and discussing what was happening. Melanie's primary complaint coming in for the visit was very severe, very uncontrollable diarrhea. This began after chemotherapy was concluded and it had remained for the last two years. It was kind of heartbreaking for her to deal with this. She had six to seven urgent bowel movements per day, Bristol six or seven on the Bristol stool chart here seen on the right. She had terrible bloating, abdominal pain, and very, very malodorous, uncontrollable gas. She also was experiencing some rectal bleeding, but it was pretty clear that it was from hemorrhoids because those were found in the colonoscopy and she had just had a colonoscopy recently. So we weren't worried about a resurgence of her colorectal cancer. And we assumed that the hemorrhoids were being exacerbated by the frequent bowel movements that she was having. Upon Melanie coming into the office, we decided to proceed and run a GI map to assess what was happening with her microbiome. I had assumed that because of the chemo and the radiation, there was a pretty drastic hit to the microbiome, so we decided to test and see if I was correct. Uh, the next slides will be what we did, what we found on the GI map and how we proceeded with treatment. So this was the first page of her GI map. I lovingly call this to patients the bad news page. I tell them anything on this page. I usually treat with some kind of pharmaceuticals. Nothing came up on her bad news page, which was a good thing. This was phase two, the H. pylori section of her test. Melanie was not having any upper GI symptoms. She wasn't having an abdominal pain or belching or any pain in the upper GI. She was having lower GI abdominal pain. And so this H. pylori did not make me want to treat it. It was not flagged as high, so we left it alone. This is a look at her commensal bacteria. I was surprised at how not bad it looked. As far as the commensals, the main issue we had is the Faculobacterium uh, presnitzii was completely non-detectable. Little background about this species, because it is pretty important. This is a species that is really responsible for butyrate production. It's somewhere between 5 to 15% of a total microbiota in a healthy Western adult. And its major role is to pr uh, produce butyrate, which is a short-chain fatty acids that serves as the primary energy so source for the colonocytes. It also has a lot of anti-inflammatory known effects. And so basically the, the bacteria produces bioactive molecules with anti-inflammatory properties that help uh, control the gut environments. It's also um, people who have a, an abundant amount of Fecalobacterium presnitzii are highly sensitive to changes in the gut environment and it can affect both um, inflammation and uh, reactivity to food. And it is having a lower amount or having no fecal bacterium presentii has been linked to a bunch of different conditions, including but not limited to inflammatory bowel disease, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and colorectal cancer. The next thing that's abnormal on this page is her firmicutes. So her bacteroid is within normal limits, but we can say that we can see that her firmicutes is quite elevated. The firmicutes bacteroides ratio is also within normal limits, but starting to trend towards the higher area. The that ratio is actually pretty important because it shows it's been known to when you have a shunted ratio, it's been known to be associated with multiple different conditions. And you know, the firmicutes bacteroides 
antibodies ratio, what that's looking at is it's looking at the two major bacteria phyla within the gut, the Firmicutes and the Bacteroides. And there should be a balance between those two. When the balance goes out of whack, and especially when the balance goes out of whack with a higher Firmicutes and Bacteroides, we see a link to a, a lot more inflammatory conditions. We see a link to inflammatory bowel disease. We see a link to obesity. And um, this is a marker that kind of lets us gauge exactly how homeostatic the microbiome is. The next section is looking at her dysbiotic or overgrowth bacteria. And what we see here is an elevation of Enterococcus faecalis and then Staph aureus and Streptococcus species. What this is telling us is there definitely is some dysbiosis present. Enterococcus faecalis happens to be a species that goes elevated when there is, it's more likely to be elevated when there's a dysbiotic terrain present. And that's also so true with Staph and Strep. So we see that shin, sh uh, shunt in her microbiome as well. When we looked at her inflammatory or autoimmune-related bacteria, none of them were coming up positive on the stool. And then commensal inflammatory and auto autoimmune bacteria, none of them were flagged either. A lot of them were present, but they weren't present at enough uh, elevations for me to want to worry about them. Finally, we came to her candida species, and this actually was significantly elevated. Uh, the candida species was elevated at 1.74 E5, which was enough for me to assume that she had significant uh, uh, candida enteritis present within the bowels. Candida is also a normal component of the microbiome, and it can absolutely be present in healthy individuals. We think that on average, candida makes up somewhere between 0.1 to 1% of the microbiome. However, there are lots of conditions that can cause candida to overgrow and you know take over a microbiome or intestinal tract. That would involve antibiotic use that would involve a compromised immune system, long-term dietary changes, antibiotic uses, and then the use of pharmaceuticals like proton pump inhibitors. The symptoms of intestinal candidiasis really match her symptoms. They include, you know, GI symptoms include diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating, gas, and then frequent mucus within the stool. She had virtually all of those. She did report mucus on occasion, but it wasn't there frequently. On top of that, she had lots of fatigue, headaches, and sugar cravings. This is really important because on my first intake with her, she was describing her diet and it was latent with processed refined garbage. You know, lots of soda pop, lots of uh, white bread, lots of white rice, lots of sugars. She, her dietary habits were just really predisposing her to having more of a candida infection. And then I think that all of the intense treatment for her cancers also made a lot of an issue for her. We did not find any viruses present within her microbiome. As far as protozoa go, we did find Diantamoeba fragilis as one of her overgrowth species. Diantamoeba fragilis is a little bit gray in how you look at it. Some people can absolutely have Diantamoeba fragilis infections and be completely asymptomatic. However, there's also a subset of people who can have this per uh, protozoal infection and be very symptomatic. The trick with Diantamoeba fragilis is the symptoms are pretty similar to what our patient was experiencing. They're, they could be abdominal pain, diarrhea, gas, and bloating. Because the fact that the symptom picture was so similar, it was my decision that I was going to start by treating the Diantamoeba fragilis. And so the first thing that I did was I gave her antiparasitic medications. In my experience, those are more effective. And uh, I treated her with that. Unfortunately, the reason I'm presenting this case is because while the treatment of Diantamoeba fragilis, um, it, when we retested on a standard lab, nothing came back, the candida, we at that point decided to treat the candida because that's what we were thinking the underlying cause was. This is what her functional um, GI markers look like. Everything was well within normal limits. Her fecal fat was fine. Her pancreas with the fecal elastase one was working very effectively. The immune system was revving high, but not so high that it was flagged. And then her small bowel, the zonulin, looked actually really, really good as well. 
As I stated earlier, the first thing that we did was treated the diantamoeba fragilis. I took a pharmaceutical route because I've had better success with that. I used the pharmaceutical tinidazole for three days, and then I had her repeat in two weeks. When I dose antiparasitic medications, I usually dose around the full in the new moon. It's a three-day course with tinidazole, so I have her take medication the day before, the day of, and the after, and the day after the full moon and the new moon. There is absolutely no clinical trials to tell me that that has validity. However, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that goes really way back that talks about the general uh, life cycle of parasites and protozoa, which are about every two weeks. And uh, dosing it around the new and the full moon, I do think, has some kind of anecdotal backing to it. I did have her follow up in the clinic after she was done with that. Um, tinidazole protocol, and it did not have any efficacy. So we decided to move on to treating the candida that was present within her stool. There's a couple of different ways that I will often treat candida. I usually like to start by some kind of very gentle pharmaceutical like nystatin. I explained to patients that nystatin is by no means the most effective drug that I have, but it really is the safest. And so we like to start there to see if we can get a little bit of traction. Whenever I use any antifungal, either herbal or pharmaceutical, I always pair it with a high dose hemicellulose enzyme blend. Hemicellulose has both um, uh, animal and human data shows that it increases efficacy of antifungal medications in the study that I was thinking about, particularly looking at Diflucan, and that increased efficacy makes the pharmaceutical more effective. So I always utilize a hemicellulose enzyme base, and then I usually use what I lovingly call an antifungal parade, where I'll just rotate them through through a variety of different antifungal herbal medications. So some supplements that are carminative, essential oil and base, some uva ursi has some data for treating fungus, as does oregano and garlic, caprylic acid, and cinnamon. And then I also like to utilize a probiotic blend in there to see if she can get some relief. I followed up with her at about the two and a half, three month point, and she was doing remarkably well. Her condition was significantly more stable. She had had no diarrhea in the past month. She was still unable to eat raw foods, which was a problem she had originally, but her diet had, had, her diet had significantly more variety. She wasn't just eating refined processed garbage. She was eating vegetables that were cooked. She was eating proteins that were healthy. Her, she had a drastic improvement in both her gas and her bloating and complete resolution solution of both the rectal bleeding and the pain. She was having about one to two bowel movements a day that were a bristle three to four on the stool chart, which is completely normal and appropriate. She really responded very well to this protocol. It took a little while and really it we needed all of the things to be on board for her to get resolution, but she was now significantly more stable and significantly more comfortable in her life. I included some references for you guys. These are the studies that I utilized to write this presentation.